Welcome to The Swing of Things with Amanda Krause, a brand new podcast hosted by me, Amanda Krause, and produced with Row 360. We're going to talk a little bit about rowing and a lot about other things. In this episode, I'm joined by four individuals leading U.S. rowing teams to Tokyo. Mike Tatey is the men's head coach. Mike and fellow men's coach Tim McLaren join us from Oakland, California. Ellen Minzner is the Para High Performance Director and discusses the importance of perseverance. But first up is Tom Terhar, the women's head coach who guided the eight to 11 consecutive world and Olympic titles. Well, welcome to the swing of things, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. So this is an exciting time for you and the women. I know you're in the midst of selection and looking towards Tokyo. Maybe we can sort of start at the beginning, you know, how old were you when you first took, when you first moved into the the head coaching role at U.S. Rowing? You were very young. I mean, you're still very young. Uh, I would have been uh, 31. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, I was young. Yeah. Yeah. Was that intimidating to move into that role at that age? Um, you know, it wasn't as intimidating because I was young and naive, right? Yeah. Um, but it was almost, I would say it was a little early, but it was almost a natural progression. And I think the expectations weren't huge on me when I first started. But I had worked with the sweep coach for uh, three years leading up to 1996. And then I had worked with a sculling coach for four years leading up to 2000. So I kind of knew everyone, knew most of the athletes. Yeah, I, I wasn't even planning on applying for the position. And then Mark Schneiderman called me up and said, hey, are you interested? And I'm like, sure. Um, so I was a little, I was a little surprised. Uh, that I got the call. Um, but yeah, I was, I was young, but I wasn't that intimidated. I didn't, you know, again, when you're that age, you're not thinking, you're yeah. not thinking too much other than can we win? Yeah. It's probably better not to know at that point what you're getting yourself into in some ways. And before then, when that happened, you were coaching at Columbia. Is that right? Yeah. So when I was, uh, when I was working with Hartmut in Chattanooga, that's all I was doing. And, and bartending and waiting tables. Okay. Um, and then when I started with Igor, I was at Columbia University and I finished up in 2001. Um, and that's when I took over that spring of 2001. Okay. So then you transitioned over to becoming the head coach. I think the attitude must've been, okay, what can you do? And you found success very quickly with the women's team. What do you... What do you attribute that to? Did you come in with a plan of knowing exactly what you wanted to do and how you wanted to do it and, and you know, said, OK, I'm going to execute on this plan? Or, or what were you thinking when you first came in? Uh, of course, I had a plan, but then, you know, reality sets in and you have to make adjustments. I wasn't anticipating where I ended up after two years. Um, I learned so much. <laughs> I learned so much as soon as I got on a body of water that wasn't moving so quite so quickly. You know, you get on you get on the Carnegie and uh, you know you can really see you can really see a lot of things and learn a lot of things. Yeah, it was great. I, I came into a very young group. There were almost every one of the two thousand women's eight kind of cycled through, thinking they were going to come back. And very few of them stuck around. the The group was so young. It was so different, uh, but it was perfect because they were, you know, they didn't know any better, you know, and, and I was, you know, able to, I think, experiment a little bit and learn quite a bit. Um, and then I also had really good help sitting and listening to Mike and Chris Corzo and um, Chris Nielsen, Chris Wilson, all of these experienced coaches were around me too. And it was really collaborative and it was, it was great. You know, I remember going to Canadian Henley in 2002. We didn't go to Europe at all that year. And we went to Canadian Henley and I remember my B boat beat my A boat, <laughs> um, but both of them beat Canada. So it was okay. okay. And then we went and did a camp, but I remember calling up Corzo and asking him, you know, like, what do you think? And, and he was, you know, he was, he was very helpful. So I had a lot of support when I first started out to help me figure out basically what I wanted. And do you think that at, you know, this many years in, does a coach, I guess the question is at this point, this many years in, what is a coach still learning? I think better and better ways to teach what you want. Um, and then you're also learning a new, basically a new interaction with, with people because every generation and every group of athletes are so different. Mm -hmm. um, and over the past 20 years, it's just changed dramatically. I think you pick up little bits of things that maybe help what you want to achieve as far as it, whether it's technical or physiological, but then also you're interacting 
with athletes that are just, they're very different as mm-hmm. I get older, maybe they're not changing as much, but I'm getting older. So it's, uh, it's always exciting to go down to the boathouse. You know, there, it's just never, it's never boring. There's always some conversation going on that maybe you shouldn't hear sometimes, but they're always, it's always entertaining and it's always education. I think that's a good segue into, you know, so many people you're known for, you know, and I just read Karen Davies article about you. I wouldn't say a man, a few words, but you know, you're, you're not saying a lot. And I think you're very, it seems like you're a different person when you're engaging with the athletes versus when you're chatting, you know, chatting in a, in a launch or at lunch or, and you've, you've created this very clear sort of boundary. How does that, how do you think that serves, serves you well, or serves the program well in, in terms of working with the athletes? I, I think it's, it, sometimes it's, it's not helpful because I think the athletes are a little bit, they can be a little bit intimidated sometimes, uh, despite every effort not to. Yeah. But the downside for me of getting, becoming too friendly would be any sort of favoritism. Mm -hmm. You know, I would, I, I think my role in this position is to provide the most fair, uh, the most, um, consistent evaluation so that they can achieve what they want. And, you know, as the athletes graduate, move on, and then they come back and then we have a few drinks and sit around and, and we go over things. Um, you kind of find out, yeah, they were, you know, afraid to ask some questions, but what you hear oftentimes is I didn't need, I didn't really need the answer. I knew if I needed the answer, I could come talk to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I just feel like it's pretty important to keep some distance and to try to make it as, as professional as possible. It has to be human, but I do think it has to be very professional because this is, the stakes are very, as high as they get in our sport. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is as hard as anything is in the world. It is very, very difficult. So, um, you know, I kid around, um, I like having fun with them, but at the same time, you know, they know when, when I stop, it's, it's time to Let's just right. get to work and make right. sure that we're not wasting any time. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And and how have how have you all been so successful? I know you get that question a lot, but what do you attribute that to? I used to just say it's just the athletes, um, but I know that it's it's much more than that. I mean, it does go into other coaches, college program. Um, it's basically a whole feeder that kind of gets really solid group of athletes together, and then we really try to keep things as simple as possible um, because like anything, it can get very complicated very quickly. But I think we have a great talent base. Mm-hmm. We've kind of refined the ways of identifying the athletes that we think have the long-term potential, mm-hmm. which is not always the the star in college or the star in high school. Um, and I think by keeping them uh, basically accountable as much as possible and individually accountable, that helps them learn and grow at an extremely high rate. And then keeping them in a group together really helps. Just the the amount of times that an athlete makes a big step because another athlete next to them is making a big step. It's it happens almost every six weeks mm-hmm. that someone makes some sort of improvement because they looked over and they saw some kid who maybe just got here or has been here for a long time, but is making a big step and it's almost inspirational. And there's been plenty of studies that say that everyone works better when they work with someone else, of course, um, especially when it comes to physical, you know, physical work. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a whole bunch of factors, but I would, I would definitely say that the group that we have and the group that we build, uh, is pretty special. Yeah. I wouldn't, you know, uh, other countries have small boat skills. They have people rowing singles, you know, since they were 10 or 11, they have great doubles. They have all of the, I wouldn't trade it what we have as far as our athletes go, because I think what we have is a fantastic foundation. For big boats going fast. Tied to that, what's your what's your hope? You know, not not anyone else's hope. What's what's your hope for the future of of women's rowing in this country? I hope I just hope that it, it still continues to build in stature um, and accessibility, and that it becomes basically a, almost like a we have a wonderful tradition in men's rowing, but I think women's rowing can be something different, maybe maybe better, maybe larger, with uh, definitely more more inclusion. Um, it, it's not, it's not as expensive, you know, to row, making it a really, really huge base, almost like swimming. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I would like. I would like it so that more and more people, even if they don't stick with the sport, at least get a taste of it and have more access to it. And then of course, I, I can't not say it. It would be really nice if 
if the United States women were, you know, winning medals in about five or six events on a regular basis, that yeah. would be that would be a hope. They're looking really great right now. If you were to share one piece of advice for coaches who are just starting out, what would that B. I would say it's kind of, it's, it's double. And I do think that, believe it or not, what we do at the elite level is very similar to what we do at the high school level. It's just, it's just more intense, but it's very, very similar. The, the high school rower is still that college rower. They still have a lot of the same issues. Um, I would say give everyone a chance and don't assume, you know, really anything. Let them tell you whether or not they're good um, with their, with their actions. That's what I would say is that, there is an, an i think with many young coaches and even experienced coaches they feel that they have to know what the outcome is going to be and we can't because they're human yeah. and they're go sometimes they're going to be great and sometimes they're not going to be great and you're going to learn a whole lot if you go into any sort of evaluation or teaching situation where you just say let's see let's see how this goes and let, let's give them a little bit of time to show what they can do i really like that have you clearly you're married to a teacher? Have you, have you been surprised? How often are you surprised where you think, wow, I would not have predicted that this woman would have turned into an Olympian or a world champion or. Well, that, that one I'm, I'm in that respect, I am overly optimistic. Like I never, I, I, I never give up on anyone. Um, and that's probably to a fault. Sometimes, sometimes they're probably like, would you just tell me to go away? Right. But I'm like, no, it's not over until you say it's over because no one is done. Um, I'm surprised. I would say every week, like there's just, there's always a, there's something that comes up and sometimes it's the wrong way or the less positive way or the greater opportunity for learning way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm surprised quite often, but I do think that what we are capable of is really what you are willing to do. And anyone who kind of comes to Princeton or comes to the training center, there's something there and we've seen that that person, whether it's their physiological makeup or their technical makeup or their, um, you know, their mindset, we've seen that person be successful before. Um, and it's, it's not just like there's only two types or three types of athletes that are successful. So I'm, I'm always overly optimistic that someone can can if they're not where they are, all they need to do is keep plugging away and you will eventually figure out a way to do it. Right, right. Because, is, because it is just rowing. It's not gymnastics. Right. right. I use gymnastics a lot as my comparison, too. It's really just it's literally the same thing over and over again. And is everyone I don't think coachable is the right word, but can you turn anyone if they have enough power? Can you get them to row well? Uh, I guess that's a subjective. <laughs> that's a subjective evaluation. I think I can get them to row effectively. Now, would um would a you know a technical perfectionist say, "Wow, that's beautiful"? No, or yes, but they won't go fast. But I do think that if someone is physiologically um, and it's ne it's never gifted, it's always like, "Yeah, you've got the gift, but then you've got to back it up, right? You can't just be talented in the sport. You have to be talented, and then you have to do a tremendous amount of work, right? And if they do that, um, I think we can fit them into an eight. Yes, a pair, maybe not. <laughs> um, a quad, maybe. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, you know, the bigger the boat, the higher the speed, um, the more, I would say, wiggle room you have yeah. for technical inefficiencies. Right, right. To find to find a home for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have, I don't know, we have not had many that have not been able to do it um, if they are physiologically gifted and they've done the work. But it's that and they've done the work that's the key. And there's that no is getting around the work, right? There's no shortcut yeah, and, there. <laughs> no. And there's no, um, it's so individual too. Meaning you could have someone who you would say, okay, this, this person has a great er ergometer score there. That's plenty like that's, but for that person, they're not in shape yet for their physiology. And it's a, it's not really complicated, but it is a little bit complicated in that I'll use Michelle Garrett. Um, she was a, a, a Harvard Radcliffe rower. Um, she won a silver medal in Beijing. Yep. Strongest woman, strongest woman I, I've ever seen, especially she was, she was not 
huge, but she was solid, but she was so strong. And it took her about six years to finally get in shape enough so that she could work really hard. Even though what she was doing before that was still beating everyone, she literally had to build enough of an aerobic capacity around her anaerobic ability huh. to be able to continue to push. Wow. Okay. And, and she was, we used to have her do a 2K ergometer test before she went out and raced in her first three years. You can ask Chris, ask Chris Wilson about that one. That was, it was something just to kind of like calm her down. And she was so strong, she would do it and she would perform better if we did that. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. That's, that's uh unique, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. She, yes, she was, she's is, but she was definitely a phenomenal athlete and also super competitive and super driven. Yeah. How much is that a part of it? I mean, so, you know, let's say you've got someone who's incredibly strong and they're technically very talented and they do the work. How much of it is, um, you know, when it comes down to the wire, what's happening in their heads, right? Um, I, I wouldn't say their hearts, but they're, you know, that that drive to, you know, if all else is equal, how much of that is about that mental toughness? That's 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 the biggest factor by far. Wow. That's definitely the biggest factor. Um, uh, you can't, yeah, you can't be talented to fit and go 98%. It just, it, it won't work. You will right. at some point you'll, you'll trip up and you'll have a tough time. So that is the, I would say that's the biggest factor. And then you have the other end, sometimes athletes that aren't as talented and they aren't as gifted, but they basically just sink their teeth in and they don't stop until they've succeeded. Um, and those people will beat the talented kids with the capacity who are at 98% every time. Wow. And how do you know who those people are? Is that just day in and day out watching them do pieces and being at races? And Yeah. I mean, it's you, we spend, you know, four hours a day with them, about 300 and yeah. <laughs> 40 days out of the year. Um, you spend a lot of time with them and you, you, you can just see it. And yeah. you can also see when they're starting to struggle a little bit and they just need a little conversation. Right. Um, so that's super interesting. What, yeah. so shifting now over to Tokyo, let's talk about that for a minute okay. and just the Olympics in general, because, you know, I was talking to Mike Tatey about this too. And I think you guys are so used to this at this point, you know, Yep, yeah, it's another Olympics. And I imagine it doesn't get old, but maybe it does. I, I don't want to make any assumptions. But so for those people, that's this is the vast majority of the population who will never go to an Olympic Games and have never, will never. What is it like when you're there? Are there specific moments that stand out as a coach where you think, oh, wow, <laughs> This is, this is really special. This is, you know, take us, take us there for a minute. What are, what are those moments? I, I wish I could say that it was just, wow, special. Uh, unfortunately for myself, and I can only speak for myself, a lot of it is just, you are hyper-focused and you're quite nervous yeah. the whole time. <laughs> um, it's very, very um, stressful. It, it hits home that it's special, usually around uh, reps and semis where you just see people elevate and their performance and you see the the excitement of making an olympic final which a lot of people don't get to see um you get to see that excitement um and it it, it it's different than a world championships obviously um i mean we have the worlds every year and it's kind of the same but it's different mm -hmm. and i think the every olympics even though i've been to a couple every olympics is so different it has a very different feeling a very different vibe um and then it's just at the end that it all starts to go like okay it's an olympics as mm -hmm. soon as you know hopefully someone has a medal around their neck and then you can say okay this is incredibly special but uh, while you're going through it you try not to do anything other than focus on what you're trying to do and don't kind of acknowledge yeah the gravity of it because you know, you know, it's there, but you try to keep it at bay for as as long as possible. Just focus. I think it hits. Yeah, it hits the athletes for sure. Uh, or it, it, it has, and I don't think it will this time uh, when they hear the crowd. You know, that is that is something that is not at a world championships. And it's, it's, you know, depending on where it is. I think they've all been pretty close to deafening, like they've been extremely loud. Wow. Um, <laughs> What's that feeling yeah. when they when they've won? 
for you as a coach? I mean, I, um, they've come across the finish line. They've won. I mean, what are, what's your feeling at that moment? Um, tremendous relief. <laughs> uh, not that, not that they won really is just that they came home with a medal. That's the biggest thing for me. Um, cause my wife did not come home with any medals. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of how, if you're putting in that work, that that's really what you're, you're trying to achieve. Um, and there are lots of other fantastic benefits to, you know, trying for an Olympic team and not getting a medal, but um yeah i would say relief is is has been the overriding <laughs> uh in 2004 when they got a silver medal the van stopped early i couldn't see the finish and all i did was run down it was like usa asking random people and they're like <laughs> uh second third i'm like Are you sure no fourth he's like yeah i'm like okay all right <laughs> good second third you know first would have been nice but um I, I just know how hard it is, how incredibly hard it is to win an Olympic medal. And if they can do it, it's a tremendous amount of relief. The most enjoyable thing I think is always, or it has been, and I've been incredibly blessed to experience it. Thanks to the athletes is hearing our national anthem. That's, mm. that is really cool. That's when it hits home. You know, that is, that makes it a lot. And, and you can see it in the athletes too. They just, they start to flow. They start to realize what they did. So it, that is an incredible experience. I hope someday to, you know, experience it again, but um, yeah, yeah. It, it is, it is special, but it is, let's put it this way. When it's over, you're ready to go home <laughs> as a coach. You are absolutely ready to go home. Pack Not that in. you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to participate in, in the activities, but you are, um, you're definitely on edge for a good two and a half, three weeks. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. And needless to say, we will, we will all be cheering for this team. Um, we're almost there. And, and I'm, I'm sure you're looking, looking forward to it, but also looking forward to the relief of it being over. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you, Tom. And I, I have one question that I always ask everyone who's come on on this podcast. And it's, what is your go to and I know you're coaching and not rowing, but you, you know, you must still get hungry. What's your go to meal for when you're off the water? You've been on the water for a long time. What are you looking forward to eating when you get off the water? I get off the water. Usually it's drinking coffee. <laughs> and then if I'm going to eat, um, it might be something as simple as a just a sandwich. It doesn't have to be anything major, just a sub. That's it. It's a humble man, folks. Just a sandwich yeah. and a cup of coffee. <laughs> yes. You should yep. hear what your rowers are talking about eating when they get off the water. Yeah. It's a bit more yeah. than that. Yeah. There's a lot of ice cream, uh, Slurpees, which is good. Well, that's calories are calories when you're working out that much. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for your time. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you and you're going to have so many people cheering, cheering you and the women on this summer in Tokyo. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's fun. That was Tom Terhar. Next up, I spoke to Para High Performance Director, Ellen Minsner. Great. Ellen, welcome to the swing of things. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So my first question for you is around having been a world champion in lightweight rowing. Was that 95 mm -hmm. and 96, right? Uh, is that right? Yes. You're not quite 96. sure. You're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I would love just to hear your transition from being a rower on the national team and being so successful there to moving over to coaching para. I actually don't know mm -hmm. how that transition took place. Yeah, sure. Well, I think for me, I I had uh, an amazing end to my rowing career, but it didn't start out like blazingly successful and full of glory. In fact, uh, I didn't even um, make the first squad at the what at the time was the training center, uh, Boston Rowing Center. So I tried out as a lightweight, didn't make the team, finally made the Boston Rowing Center squad, but still didn't get the invite to selection camp finally made selection camp um, and I made my first national team in 1991, was fortunate enough to get a bronze medal. And then objectively, my career kind of went a bit downward, like third place medal to a fourth place to an alternate position to not making the team in 94. 
But for me, my ERG score kept getting better by chunks. And I felt like, well, I know that I'm improving despite all evidence to the contrary. <laughs> and I wanted to really stick that out. I thought, well, once my ERG starts to really level out and not improve anymore, then I'll, I'll probably be done. But uh, I continued to improve and decided to go for the, uh, the Pan Am Games um, in 95, which were um, earlier than the World Championship were picked. And uh, Christine and I just found we had really good speed that early in the season. So we went on to uh, World Championships in 95 and 96 um, and uh, won the World Championship. So I feel like one of the reasons I got into coaching in general was to just you know, relay that message that it's really true in rowing, that if you put the work in over time, it really will pay off. You know, I had lived this experience where I, I was not the, you know, amazing rowing recruit that walked into a training center and, and went on to the national team right away. So that's why I got into coaching in general. And the para coaching happened a little bit, I won't say by accident. I mean, community rowing was a strong um, uh, para program and adaptive programming all throughout. And uh, when the coach retired, they contacted Bruce and myself at CRI to see if we might be interested in taking on the camp. So so we did. But I applied those same principles because uh, we wanted to have it be as competitive as possible. And I really felt like, well, look, if I could do it, lots of people can. It doesn't matter if you wherever you start out from, whether it be based on your disability or based on the fact that you, you didn't have like a super competitive uh, rowing background, I felt like I was able to apply those things uh, to para coaching. And thinking about coaches who are just starting out as coaches of para athletes, mm -hmm. are there, I mean, do you have any advice for people starting out who've coached before, coached mm -hmm. rowing, yeah. but coaching para athletes is new to them? Yeah, I think that it's really fundamentally the very same thing as when you encounter a new a new rower for the first time without a disability. We want to have that sort of welcoming environment. We want people to feel comfortable. I just think there's a, just a certain level of um, of depth that needs to happen in that first conversation about what the athlete's abilities are or limitations might be, what their goals might be. So I think the first thing um, would just encourage people is to remain welcoming, even if it turns out that your program or you as a coach may not actually have the right uh, set up or constraints to work with that athlete. They're still welcome into the sport. There may be ways to um, redirect, but I think having a, a welcome first time to the boathouse, like anybody else, maybe there's a tour of the boathouse, meeting people, watching the practice mm -hmm. um, so that athletes know what the general expectations are of the program. And then I really recommend an intake interview. So where there's a time to sit down with that athlete, uh, with a parent or a guardian if necessary, or even a personal care attendant, so that you know all of the other things that um, that the athlete may um, need to share with a coach in order to have that coach be able to work effectively with that athlete. And then maybe we should do that with all athletes. Oh, it's coming up in level two. <laughs> As you're describing that, I'm thinking, wow, uh, why well, don't we do that with everybody? Yeah, well, I think there are when we we do a good job right now of when we have a, a we post a program for rowers uh, on our website for, for any of oh, this is for youth age, this or whatever. A lot of uh, the general population will, will be able to read what's on a, a, a program's website and know that that program is for me. And I kind of generally understand what the expectations are. Um, but for athletes with a disability, there needs to be a, just a greater level of detail about mm -hmm. what those basic eligibility requirements are? Is this an athlete trying to um, be assimilated and just go and join an open program? And there may be uh, basic reasonable accommodations that a coach or the program could make to just, you know, have that athlete join uh, whatever the typical program offering is there. Or it may be the case that um, after this sort of intake process that this person may benefit most from a, a tailored program, either tailored for people with disabilities or tailored for a, a particular um, set of equipment that's used and shared by other athletes, or maybe it's more that they need to be with their own age group or, or peer group of women or military or what have you. So I think having the ability to do that, it does it would be great to do that for the general population. I don't know that we have all that time, but I think the idea is 
the the person with a disability needs a little bit more information so that mm-hmm. they also know this is a safe, effective, and fun program for me. I already know that going into it. Or, geez, maybe I need to also figure out if this is the fun, safe, effective thing for me or not. So I just think a greater level of information sharing has to happen in order for the coach and the athlete to work well together moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's wise. What, so Mm. let's, let's shift over to Tokyo for now. Mm. Um, Yeah. Super exciting. It's finally happening. Yes. And what can you talk to us about who's who's going from the United States? What boats are we sending? Who oh, are you sure. excited about? I mean, you're excited about all of them. I'm excited about all highlights. of highlights. Oh, yeah. Well, we are um, we qualified every single boat for the Paralympic Games through the 2019 World Championships, which is the it's no small feat. I know that uh, the para program is is smaller than our open senior teams. There's fewer events, but um, having coached. Uh, this, I, I coached the PR three, four since 2013. So I've been involved in the program since 2013 and seeing the growth of the sport internationally and how competitive it is internationally. When I tell you, it's incredible that we got everybody through, uh, via the world championships performance. Um, I'm super proud of that. The other thing to note is that the same athletes who qualified these boats are competing in these boats. So, oh, yep. amazing. Yeah. Okay. So we've got Blake. And for listeners who don't who don't know this, the people who qualify the boats don't necessarily compete in the Olympics. They just qualify the boat as, that's a, right. as a boat, as a class. Um, yep. So that's that's unique, isn't it? And uh, especially since it's now two years will be two years ago. Yeah. So we had uh, we had a challenge in the PR2 this year, um, but the people who uh, qualified the the event in 2019, Russell Gurnall and uh, Laura Goodkind, they won the trial. So that was great. We had a very uh, competitive uh, PR3-4 camp this year. Very, very tight racing. And I think probably the the tightest concentration of talent I've ever seen for that boat. And uh, that's going to be very exciting. So we have, by qualifying the, the event, you know, we, we like to think we were a final material in all events the best uh, hope based on past performance and even, you know, currently what we have right now, the PR three, four has won a silver medal since 2014 uh, behind great Britain. We've been in a few different combinations. They've been in a few different combinations. Uh, Both, both crews are uh, going to be very fast along with all the other a finalists. So it's going to be a very exciting Tokyo games and if people want to see incredible athleticism, I'm so excited for the television coverage because um, you asked me earlier in the conversation about if there's any misconception about para rowers. I don't know if it's a misconception, but I don't know if people really fully understand the athleticism of the U.S. Paralympic team and all Paralympic teams in general. But when we look at a, a, a Blake who is going to be competing in canoe kayak as well, we look at, uh, you know, Danny Hansen is uh, returning from the from the Rio uh, Paralympic four. She's one of our most experienced athletes, still able to make the make the program and very tight racing there. Uh, we've got Hallie, who has uh, in the past has a bronze medal and we don't know how fast she's going to be able to get uh, from trials to now. So that's really exciting. And the double of Laura and Russell. Um, they have made so many changes to their rigging and their training, and uh, they they don't even train together every single day, but they meet up in uh, Chula Vista, uh, you know, every other weekend when they can to get together, get on that buoyed course. And uh, I'm just incredibly proud of all of the athletes and the coaches because it's a it's an incredible team, the best I've seen. That's oh, the best you've seen. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's exciting. And yeah, tell us. Are th- are all of the boats the team boats co-ed? Yeah, by definition, when the uh, Paralympics were introduced, they wanted to uh, achieve gender parity right from the get-go. So any any team boat is a combination of men and women. So the PR three mixed four, two men, two women. Uh, they can be any side combination, whatever. Just uh, that's what we have. And then the PR two mixed double, one man, one woman. And. Uh- how, one, how do you feel about that? And two, do you think that there, that's a model that the rest of the sport should be looking at and following? It's so funny. I was asked that in 2016, I think as well. And I I love it. 
I I really enjoy it. It is difficult. I you know it's it is difficult and it can be difficult. It um from a coaching perspective and sort of managing different um perspectives and personalities in one boat. But I really appreciate the the philosophy behind why they did that. I have learned so much about individual rigging as have the coaches that work with the PR three, four in particular, and, and probably Alice with the double, she's done an incredible job balancing uh, men and women of different sizes, erg scores and physical length is really challenging. But as we have to get better at that from a rigging perspective, it really applies to other coaching. And I feel like I'm, we are very good at, individual rigging and a lot of programs are starting to get into that uh with their uh, with their own athletes even without disabilities so i think it's actually like really exciting from what you for what you can learn from how to balance that uh, that difference and i really like the philosophy behind why it's there and someone asked me and said oh, well how is it for the men and the women do the do the do the para men get more funding than the para women? And I said, nope, <laughs> they all get as little or as much as yeah. the women do because it, they're all literally the same crew. So I've, I've really appreciated it um, and, and like it very much. That's sort of neat. And I was I've been wondering if, you know, other categories will follow suit and, and try that out. I know that that's done a little bit with masters rowing, you know, mixed doubles or, yeah. but well, I think when you, you know, for fun, when you when you can brainstorm about what the Olympics could be in the future um, and, and rowing having its unique place in the Olympics, um, there's not a lot of sports that you could actually do uh, in, on a co-ed basis without uh, without a lot of uh, other considerations. So um, I, I think it's incredible um, when you think about the opportunity. In fact, one time we we entered in the head of the Charles. They have this thing called the Director's Challenge Eights, which um, the Director's Challenge Mixed Eights, excuse me. So it's a combination of men and women. As you said, a lot of masters do mixed boat rowing and it's a lot of fun. But we took uh, we got medal winners from the Rio Paralympic Games. So it was uh, a combination of U.S., Great Britain, Canada, bronze, uh, silver, and gold medalists. And we combined four men, four women in a mixed eight, and uh, we won the event. It was so fun. And amazing. I think I think that uh, I I think it's something to think about. I don't know whether I'm going to recommend yeah. it for the open teams, <laughs> but I do think it brings a dynamic and it really shows how unique our sport is. And I, I really like that aspect of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun to think about. What is, what do you, you know, what are your hopes for, and, and we'll talk about this a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, but what are your hopes for para rowing in the United States? So thinking post-Tokyo, I mean, what do you think yeah. our opportunities are there? Well, what I hope for is that our athletes become a lot more visible out in the community, whether that be through, um, you know, television or social media, et cetera. But I also I like that they are visible in the community, you know, at different regattas or even even coaching. I think one of my favorite images is Hallie Smith, our PR one uh, single scholar, um, she has a specially designed coaching seat at Community Rowing where she can coach. Uh, she's an athlete who uses a wheelchair um, and she can coach either in the barge or from a coaching launch. And I just feel like what an incredible message and image that people see an athlete with a disability leading community programs, leading uh, lessons for other people with or without disabilities. So I, I like that aspect of it. And I want more of that because we want more young people to come out for para rowing. We we want people to to have role models to look at. Uh, like I'll never forget uh, Zach Burns, one of our um, athletes from a few years ago, very successful athlete. You know, he decided he would try out for para rowing because he read a story about Dorian Weber. Right. We can't afford to have that be just a one off. We need more of that. And so we really want to look at young people, what they're doing right now, young people with disabilities, how to find them how to encourage them to come out for rowing. And the ergometer is a great equalizer because um, it's accessible to lots of people in lots of communities. 
so one thing we're going to do is we're we're working with a, an organization right now called Angel City Sports, and they host uh, something called the Angel City Games out in Los Angeles. And uh, we're going to introduce rowing as an exhibition event there using just ergometers. So here is a multi-sport event that's uh, gone on for several years now and is growing each year and hopefully grows through uh, LA 2028. And if we can bring rowing there first on ergometers and then on water, I really feel like we'll have a lot more ways for people to find the sport in a, in a fun competitive venue and then make those decisions that will lead them to possibly a Paralympic pipeline later on, but that their first entree is competitive. This is for me. Mm -hmm. This is fun and exciting. And I want to do more. Yeah. That's what I would love to see. Surprisingly people, I shouldn't say this, but maybe I shouldn't say this, but surprisingly, I think a lot of people are drawn to their first experience on an erg, you know, it actually doesn't turn people away. Um, Yes. I found that very surprising. Uh, You know, when these erg school uh, program, erg program started rolling out in schools, I was a little bit skeptical too, but the simplicity of it and the fact that it's new and there are a lot of kids for whom uh, that that they are not going to go out for other sports um, based on the traditional model yeah. of, of trials. You don't have to catch anything so, or throw anything. You're not running. Yeah, and uh, you can do it seated. So it's very fair. You can do it in a wheelchair or or on a fixed seat. It's um, I, I like it a lot. And that's that's my hope is that we we get more out there and we we really recognize how many athletes there are with disabilities that we want to reach. And once they're in the program, we really validate that, hey, this is an athletic endeavor. This oh, is yeah. this is real. This is serious. When you want to be really good, you, you look at the athletes that are on our Paralympic team and you realize, hey, that's 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 work. That's dedication. That's all of the Olympic ideals. And um, we want to inspire. people. Yeah. Well, I hope to be your partner in that, Alan. I think you know that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So my my last question for you is, and you know, I'm finding that the lightweights don't shy away from this, but um, favorite post race meal. So you've had a hard or post row meal. You've had a hard row. Do you still row? Are you still rowing? Not as much as I should. <laughs> um, who of us actually rows? Uh, so you've you're coming in. Just pretend you just went on a long yeah. row. You're coming into the dock. Yeah. You're in Boston. Favorite post-row meal. What's your go-to? Yeah, I don't know. I was one of those sort of, uh, quote unquote, natural lightweights. And uh, sometimes I used to say, like, no food's good enough to to make up for what I just went through. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, I don't know. I, I, I think just... Um, rehydration and then um having a beer can i say that i mean that you can you know it's honest um yeah so, yeah so no f- you you just want some water and beer <laughs> okay ellen i'm seeing a new side of you <laughs> that's fair you said post race you know like i'm free to do what i want yeah you absolutely are well ellen i know i'm not alone in saying you know we're all gonna be wishing you and coaches and all the athletes the best of luck in Tokyo and and cheering and really proud already I mean just to qualify all these boats is is incredible and uh, we're certainly lucky to have you yeah yeah no I feel privileged to to be here and uh, the future is bright great thanks for joining us thank you and finally I spoke to men's head coach Mike Tatey and fellow men's coach Tim McLaren all right hi guys welcome to the swing of things thank you Glad to be here. So where are you sitting right now, dressed alike? We are sitting in the blue room, right? And the blue room at, at Cal is basically the memorabilia room. And uh, the one committee you don't want to be on if you're at Cal is the memorabilia committee because you have all these errors of these great Cal rowers that feel that they should be on the wall in the memorabilia room. And uh, so I stayed away from that as the coach. And we had a great guy that was in charge of that. Yeah, I see some great photos on the wall behind you both. And we have the 1932 Olympic crew behind us right above Tim's head. Well, I should have started with this, that we have Tim McLaren and Mike Tatey joining us, um, who are both coaching the men's team right now, gearing up for Tokyo. They're joining us from the Cal Boathouse with some great photographs behind them. And I, like I said, I love that you're dressed alike. Do you guys do this every day or? Yeah, but. This is just a coincidence. This is, we, we wear what's clean. It's and a lot of times it matches. You know, Tim and I are the same age and our birthdays are a few days apart. So. 
Who was born first? Me. A few okay. days, a few days. Really? You're just a few days apart? Yes. All right. So let's talk about that, Mike. I'm glad you you started with that because one of my favorite things about the Tatey family is its size. And, you know, can you tell us for those of uh, our listeners who don't know the size of your family? How many siblings do you have? Well, there's I'm one of ten, I'm the second oldest of 10. I have an older brother, seven younger sisters, and then my baby brother, Paul. And my dad, my, my father, was he's the youngest of 10 and had eight older sisters. So there's, there's plenty of us. And we have, I think, 34 nieces and nephews. And anyway, yeah. Can you name them all? Of course. I mean, you want me to name, I can name all my <laughs> sisters. And brothers, but yeah, we can. How much time do you have? <laughs> what was dinner time like in your household? Uh, it was... Uh, it was pretty chaotic, but, you know, my mom had everything under control. You know, we had a two-bedroom house. So if you can imagine a row home with two bedrooms, um, one bathroom. Wait, really one bathroom? Yeah, so everything was organized. I mean, my mom, um, yeah, she uh, she had everything pretty pretty well dialed in. Uh, dinner was between 5.30, it five, started 5.30 promptly. It was over at about 10 of 6 because, <laughs> because uh when we played Little League, my older brother and I, we had to do the dishes and we weren't allowed to leave the house until the dishes were done. So um, a lot of times we didn't make it to the game on time, which didn't bother my mom. But it was, uh, yeah, she, she ran a tight ship. Yeah, I'm sure she had to. That's pretty wild. Tim, do you come from a big well, family? <laughs> hard to compete with Mike in that area. Uh, there's five kids in our family, you know. Uh, so, you know, I'm second oldest of five, so... Uh, it was a decent sized family in those days, I guess. But um, yeah, I've got an older brother, a couple of younger sisters, and a younger brother. Oh, so you two have that in common too? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I promise I won't just talk to you about your families. I just, I, I always love hearing about this. So, and coming from very different places, I'd love to hear about your your starts in rowing. Um, Tim, let's let's start with you. How did, uh, and I was actually speaking with someone about this, you know, did rowing find you or did you find rowing? Because he was arguing that most people are found by the sport of rowing and not the other way around. Uh, you know, I grew up pretty much just playing rugby league in the winter and rowing surf boats in the summer. So I had a little bit more of a beach lifestyle and um, I did that for nine years. I was 25. And someone in the surf club had a contact in a rowing club, which was about an hour away. And uh, we started going up once a week, but we were mainly in the surf. Uh, we, won the, we were the national champions in surf boating. There's 122 crews in the A division. And I travelled around the world in a surfing team uh, back in 1980. So uh, I was playing football, surfing, and working as a lifeguard and a teacher. And... Uh, about 1981, I think, I gave up the football and I started sculling in the winter at a club an hour away. So I did that for a couple of years, went to the Olympics, and then I went back and started captain coaching rugby league again and coaching rowing and teaching and so on. So, so here we are. He also won a silver medal in the Olympics. So yeah. That's, he left that out, but I'll... I know I like how you went from, yeah, I surfed and then I sort of rode a little bit and then, yeah, you, <laughs> so he's the, he's the humble one here. Is that true, Mike? Yes. <laughs> All right. So Mike, did you find rowing or did it find you? Uh, it found me, uh, you know, I, uh, so I played, you know, baseball, basketball, and football, the, tr the traditional sports and in my high school, um, a lot of the guys that were on the football team, um, they would do this, you know, back then there were no ergs. It was just basically running and doing weight circuits. And they would do this winter training with the rowing team. You know, it'd be at 5.30 in the morning at the high school. And, you know, so uh, to stay in shape for football and right before basketball season, I, um, you know, I did these workouts. And my best friend on the team, well, the, my best friend who was also, um, I was on the football team with his dad, rode in the 1932 Olympics. And, um, you know, and back then, you know, it was like, wow, this guy was in the Olympics. And, and then he coached, he was a coach at our high school. And so they asked me to, you know, try out for the team because I'd done these winter workouts with the weight circuits and the running. And, um, and then when I went down to Boathouse Row, it was this whole part of Philadelphia that I didn't even know existed. And the stories were, 
incredible. And I just loved being down there. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it, there was all these stories because we had, you know, rowing at every level in Philly. You had high school rowing, collegiate rowing on a high level. And you had national team rowers, right? So, and all these national team guys, um, you know, they had all these stories of world travel. And, you know, not only had, had I never been on an airplane, I'd never been to an airport in my life. So, uh, you know, whether these stories were true or not, I believe them all. And, um, you know, and I just was hooked. I mean, I, I tell everyone I just love being down the river. I liked the training. And then, you know, I had good coaches and got better. So, so you liked it right away. Yeah. yeah. Did, was it Boathouse Row you liked? Or it was the whole. It, it was or? the whole package. It wasn't. You know, I think I didn't know that I was. You know, again, I played baseball, basketball, and football, and I didn't know that I had. I was pretty good at endurance until I started rowing. Like I'll never forget the very first practice was a three mile run, and I don't think I'd ever run more than four or five laps for football. Like I never run miles, but I was. You know, I had endurance, so I sort of was made for it. But I liked the training. But it was more that I liked the people. I liked being down on Boathouse Row. I mean, there's so many. I mean, look, I, there's so many characters down there. It's, uh, you know, there's a story a day. So and I just like being down there. So I, I tell everyone, even if I was terrible, I probably would have stuck with rowing just because I like yeah. being down there and like the people. I like the atmosphere, the whole package. Tim, when you first started rowing, did you know right away that you would end up being a successful Olympian or were you just thinking, oh, this is I'm in a boat and this is sort of interesting or, you know, what were your first impressions of the sport? I think because we'd been successful in surf, um, you know, I, I sort of went into the still water single sculling with, you know, I'd say I'd give it three years if I could make the Olympic team from scratch and... Um, so I was prepared to sort of give it a few years, but it was a bit more goal oriented. I like to row and I like the training like Mike. And, you know, I guess you think you're reasonably good at what you're doing. So, um, so you know, I was prepared to sort of make that commitment and uh, just see how it went. So I didn't really have a huge idea of the sport at large because I grew up in a whole different world, you know. It was more of a private school sport, which was in Sydney. And I was an hour plus away. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I see that. I wonder if you guys think about this at all, but I, I always wonder, I mean, the coaches of your caliber and, you know, you've seen so many rowers over so many years. Do you think that there's um, a certain type of person who rowing speaks to as a sport um, and who's who sort of has the right disposition to be su really successful in it? Do you see any themes across across athletes they do a lot of testing these days and i guess that all comes from the eastern Bloc, where they had the talent identification measuring how tall people are and how athletic they are and so on i guess what you're talking about a little predisposition is more of a attitude that's one thing they don't measure and you know we we figure that out all coaches figure that out just by you know who likes the training who turns up who offers something else to the team, who's, who adds to the chemistry. So it, it's all of the intangibles that, you know, uh, less measurable, if you like, uh, until you have people under your care over time. Do you think people are wired that way? Like, do you think that people come to, come to a program wired? Are we sort of born wired one way or another? Or can you take someone who doesn't come to you like that and turn them into that? I think that it, that's easier said than done. I think that it's more difficult to, you know, to change behavior, right? If you're, if you're used to a certain behavior, if you're not, you know, if you're generally lazy, you know, or you're generally, you know, you're, you need instant gratification. It's not the sport for you, but you can look some people, you just don't know what I, I always say is you have some people that they're sort of on the fence. We don't know. Like, again, I, like even personally, I had no idea that I was a really good endurance athlete because I never competed in any endurance sports. I just thought like, you know, okay, you ran your sprints and you ran some hills or, you might do some laps around the field or you do suicides in basketball or you run the bases, yeah. but never, you know, like if I would have known that I had 
and my parents never did anything athletic in their life. So it was, it was like, it wasn't like I had a role. My, you know, my dad, parents were pushing us into sports or anything. But, but again, we do get kids like that that are, they had no idea they were really good in endurance athletes and, and they wind up being so. Yeah. Do you think there's a, do you think there's opportunity for us as a, as a country to look towards athletes coming from other sports to shift over to rowing, even as late as, you know, college, late college, even maybe even beyond college. Is that, is that a possibility or do you think it's just, you know, it's too late in terms of muscle memory or, or those people are, you know, unique? No, I think that you, you know, if you get athletes from other sports, that's what you want. The difficulty as Tim said, is it's, you know, like I, I, again, I played basketball in college, for example. So I graduate, I'm 21 years old. I never rode. I want to learn how to row. Which one of those clubs on Boathouse Row is going to take me in? Like no one, right? You just, they don't want to teach someone how, you know what I mean? But if there was a, if there was a, if you had the resources to be able to transfer, like my, my idea always was get all the swimmers. I mean, they're used to looking at a black stripe from the time they're five years old. And generally by the time they're 18 or 19, it's a little bit different now, but you know, when I was growing up, Pretty much as a swimmer, if you hadn't done well by the time you were 18 or 19, then, um, um, you know, you weren't really going to make it at a high level. And you just get those people and just transfer them into rowing. Because, like, instead of looking at a black stripe, they're out there and rowing. They see the trees and the river. (laughs) and It's it's like it's fantastic. There's a whole new world to see above water. Sure. And I think a lot of that's why we get a lot of kids from a swimming background. It's just having the time and the resources to be able to teach them. But I think that's the key. I think if you have, if you're a good athlete, you know, you're, you're going to do, you're going to do well in our sport. I mean, look at this, uh, look at this Ali Ziegler guy, right? I mean, Tim, you can. Look, it's Mike and I talk all the time. Really rowing is unique and it's sort of self-selecting, just a criteria for almost qualification entry into the sport. If you're talking about being successful, And everyone's always talking in rowing, how can we get better people in? And I think that's the challenge, unless you run a a centralised government-funded system, you know, to get people in year in, year out over a long period of time, you know, is that what you're going to encourage your kids to do? Hey, you should take 12 years off and just row till you're 30. So, hey, don't worry about that, you know, expensive college education. So you've got to have the people who are passionate who really like it. We don't talk enough about, you know, who likes to row? Yeah. Do you have any rowers who you don't think like, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. Have you ever had any rowers who you feel like they're really talented or they wouldn't be with you if they weren't talented, but you're not sure that they really like it as much as as others? The people at this level, where Mike and I are, they like it to a degree, but it's not their main focus. They're very goal-oriented and outcome-oriented. They want to go to the Olympics, they want to win medals. Yeah. And that's a big focus. They like it on one level, but it's 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 lower down now. They've got these other priorities. Uh, when you're getting people in, it's people who like to work hard. And when kids are forming identities, you know, when they hit college and high school, yeah, it's, it's great to be on the football team, to be part of a group, you know, an identity, you know, to represent mm-hmm. this school or that college or, you know, this town. Uh, you know, you're a part of history and so on. So these are all, you know, very functional assets which kids develop over time. And uh, it's no different with us. It's a great honour to be on the national team and uh, to represent your country at Olympic Games is a, is a huge achievement. We have athletes that are, as Tim said, they're super goal-oriented. We have a lot of type A type athletes. They're, it's more they want to be successful than, well, I really love rowing. You know, but like, and again, I told you myself, I, I liked it. I liked the training, even when I wasn't doing well. I liked being down there. I liked it. And, uh, you know, I, I never, I never retired from rowing. I got cut. You know, I was on the team and, you know, I got better, won some medals, then got a little bit worse and then hung on for a few more years and got cut. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if I was any good, I, cause I like it. You know, I like, yeah. like being in the boat and as, as insignificant as rowing is, it's, it, it, I liked it, right? So, yeah. so I do think we do have athletes that are excellent rowers, 
but they're not that into rowing. You know what I mean? They don't look at, mm-hmm. I was into all the lore, you know, like the history of it. And, you know, like I told you, the rowing at Vesper Boat Club and the 19, you know, the 1902 eight, you know, and the 1964 eight and the 1956, you know, like, and these coaches and, you know, where we have a lot of athletes that they're just not into that stuff. Right. Um, mm-hmm. but, but, but that's fine. It doesn't mean they can't be successful. Right. I think that every rower, any athlete, have you ever had an athlete who you, who, is it Tim? Are you more of the technician than Mike? Am I getting that wrong? Or I know you both are obviously, but I've Tim, I think you're well known for the small boats, right. And the, being the technician, do do you ever feel like they're athletes who you just cannot get them to do what you need them to do? I think people can grasp the basics. They can move the boat, and then there are levels of how well you can move the boat. We can all go to the driving range and hit the golf ball, but how well can we hit it and how often? Straight down the middle. So, you know, I think we've had some recent challenges, uh, Mike, in the last uh, couple of years where we've had kids like that who was strong on the rowing machine, but really couldn't move the boat to the level that we require. And uh, there's only a certain amount of coaching that you should have to put into people at this level. They've got to offer a fair bit themselves. So, uh, you know, Mike and I, I think a misconception is that Mike doesn't do a lot of uh, technique, but, you know, he's technically very astute. He does a lot of work with the eight, and, um, you know, it's great to, to watch and to see that. So, you know, uh, we both focus on that enough, we feel. And, you know, the guys have got to present themselves a little bit. It is self-selecting. And uh, we try and improve the small things which we think are important within the, within the larger scheme of things. So, and, and, Mike, I wasn't suggesting you're not also a technician, obviously. I mean, I, again, you, again, it's just... No, I, I, I was going to say that it's like having, you know... I have an older brother who loves math, like just was a math genius and just loved it, like embraced it. Like he should have been a math teacher, you know, um, me, you know, I, I could barely get through arithmetic, you know? So uh, now, now I could get a tutor and they could help me with math, but, but I don't have the aptitude that my brother's going to have. And I think it's the same thing in rowing. Like you're, it's, it's, I, I always say, you know, and again, a lot of people don't like this, but, you know, coaching is overrated, you know, you, to a degree, I'm saying you can't, like rowers somehow think that it's, you can get a bad rower and just make him into an Olympic champion. And that's just, why don't you just say, well, I can get this guy who never played basketball and he can win the NBA championship. Well, you wouldn't say that, but somehow in rowing, we think that. You know, oh, we get the right right coach and the right training program and we're going to win the Olympics. And that just is not the case. So some people are just better and, you know, they're just better. And they, you know, they have a really, they have this, this skill that they're able to move a boat better. That's it. A good example, a recent example, Amanda, is um, Caracola. Uh, I was starting off the California Rowing Club when I first came to America, uh, And uh, Cara was in high school and she was a very good swimmer and she was looking at going to Cal, trying to get in. And I called Dave O'Neill and said, this girl turned up down here at the rowing club, we put her on the rowing machine. And, you know, she was good. She was tall, strong, and you could see athletic. And she picks it up. She's done okay, that Cara. Yeah, you've got to think she she won a bronze medal. She won a medal at the Olympics 2012. And, well, that was done just a few years earlier, so... Uh, I know one of my athletes sent me some, one of my Olympic medal winning athletes, Bo Hansen, sent me uh, some video of his 13 year old daughter. She'd been on the Ergo twice in her life. And here she was the second time he sent me a clip. And I showed Mike and I said, and she's six foot, but you know, well coordinated. I think, you know, they're good basketballers and good athletes and they can pick it up reasonably quickly. I mean, I can't even imagine what's going through your heads. This is not your first rodeo, not not even close, um, but certainly your first uh, COVID Olympics. And I mean, how is it different heading into Olympic Games in the midst of COVID, you know, first tacking on the extra year, but then now just, just heading into a, a place where, you know, COVID is not as under control as it is 
here in the States, um, you know, concerns there, just a very different atmosphere. I mean, how do you navigate that with, with the guys and, and how are you feeling as coaches with, you know, going into an Olympics in, in the midst of COVID? Well, I mean, I think we're f- full steam ahead. All our athletes are vaccinated and, you know, we're, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're preparing like it's, you know, we're trying to win. So, but I do think that this past year has been really beneficial to us. I think mm-hmm. that, um, especially with our younger athletes, you know, I, I, we put a big investment into the 2018 and 19 under 23 team. And, uh, and we saw these guys more that they would be the group for 2024. But that extra year, they, you know, they were forced to learn how to skull. And initially it was, mm-hmm. it was relatively ugly. And, but then they kind of mastered it and they're all pretty good. And their skills improved. And then when we got back into the small boats, into the doubles and pairs, that was way better. And then the fours seemed to be better. So we think that it's, you know, we think this extra year has really helped us. And I think the other thing is just giving the athletes that we have credit. I mean, it's a pretty lighthearted group. They seem to get along. I think the fact that we're out here, like everyone that we have out here, is from somewhere else and the fact that they had to move to a new city and Mm -hmm. far away you know across the country most of them and i think they've bonded pretty well and they've you know uh it's it's i think they've handled it about as well as it could be as well as you could Mm -hmm. handle it so i don't know what tim thinks but Uh, well the fact that we don't travel a lot in america it probably is a good thing. So the guys don't know any different in, in, in a few different ways. Um, but I think because of that goal-oriented audience, they're not going there to, to enjoy the Olympics. Their main goal is to go to try and win a race. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that's the first thing, the enjoyment and, you know, socialising and other things normal, normally associated. These are sort of byproducts of the, of the event themselves. But the main right. focus is to go to compete to win. And, you know, I think the guys here are pretty stable. And, you know, uh, I think just going through the, the process of selection, and that's a bit of an ongoing process. So, you know, I, I think they'll cope pretty well. Uh, you know, they're used to, you know, the rooms, the isolation, the masks, and all the things that will be required in Tokyo. And I think that they're all multitaskers. Like, they've all been able to keep their jobs and, you know, like tomorrow we're going to go to, okay, let's go to Sacramento. Okay. You know, they, they roll with it. Um, anytime there was another restriction, you know, for COVID, they were, you know, they rolled with it. Okay. We're back in singles. Okay. Well, we're back on the earth. They just been able to, it's, as I said, it's maybe it's their youth. I don't know. Um, but I think that, that they've handled it well. You've always been so supportive of the guys being able to work while they're rowing. And then some people will say, well, um, it's really hard, which I'm sure it is, but it, you know, it's very hard to, to work and to train full time because then it's difficult to recover. And, but the flip side is, you know, it's really valuable to have something in your life besides rowing. So what's your mindset behind that? The encouragement, not only encouragement, I know you've been really helpful on the ground, you know, helping the guys find jobs and what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I think that our demographic you know that these these guys have options you know and and you know, they're going to graduate many of them from an ivy league school at, or a top university and you know they, and even the ones that aren't from an ivy or or you know a stanford or something like that they're all pretty bright so yeah. you know they have okay am i going to go to goldman sachs <laughs> you know and or am i going to you know train four times a day so i i feel like we have to f- we would lose a lot of these athletes if they if they weren't able to work. It's just that's just that simple. Um, if if we weren't able, and I think we would have still some of the guys, but I think mm-hmm. uh, many of our key athletes would not be rowing if they weren't weren't able to work. And uh, I also think that it, it it provides that other, you know, there that other outlet. You know, if yeah. you had a bad day at rowing, you know, you go to work and you're you know you're they're just boom, dialed into their job. And I think, and I'm only going by what they tell me, you know, I mean, right. look, I would have been, I told you, I loved rowing. I would have 
if I could have just trained all day and not work, yeah. I would have loved it. But I think most of these guys are not wired that way. Um, and then, as you mentioned, they they can start a career. You right. know, they have a career path. Um, and and you know, when I look at I look at it was successful the last time we did it. You know, a lot of those guys that were rowing back in the '90s, late '90s, some of them are even retired now. So, um, and they're donors, and it comes full circle. I mean, I have to ask you guys for. Most people who will never go to the Olympics in their entire lives, so living vicariously through you for a moment, what's your what's sort of one of your favorite moments when as as a coach um, at at the Olympics? And if you, if you want to say as an athlete, instead you can do that too. But you know, what is it? Is it being on that starting line, realizing, wow, I'm at the Olympics? Is it the opening ceremonies? I mean, what is that moment, or is there a moment where you think this is? Pretty unbelievable. Look, I hate to uh, <clears throat> I hate to make it sound less exciting than it is for everyone else. I guess the coaches in our position might offer his opinion on this, but you know we're doing a job there, and uh, we don't treat it like a job. Job. We're we're not you know digging ditches, but uh, you know we're trying to achieve something in the sport for, for the guys, for the country, and so on. So I think there's a People feel a, a decent responsibility, if you like. And so uh, there's a pressure on the guys because of their expectations and their high goals, and, and I think that's very similar to the coaches. And I think, conversely, you have to, uh, you know, you spend time talking and about avoiding all the distractions and the normal things that are, you know, fantastic because you're not really on any, you're not on a Kentucky tour. You, you know, you're not there to... You know, to check the sites of whatever city and do all these other things, and and, and crews have fallen down in that regard over the years. You know, they've, uh-huh. they've gone touring, they've gotten sick. They, they, you know, really, they haven't kept a tight enough uh, circle around themselves and just knuckle down and say, well, you know, I can't eat six meals a day just because food is free. <laughs> that's the the demise of the team so tim doesn't have that that one moment come on mike you've got to have uh a- oh yeah i mean I, look I, listen you know i was an i was an alternate you know in 1984 on the team and like walking in in the opening ceremonies in the los angeles coliseum like it was it was a moving moving experience yeah, for and, athletes, and, and you know for, for, for an athlete you know um and and as a coach you know, I think that look, what you want is is you want you want your athletes to be able to do what they're capable of, right? And and um, you know, obviously, you know, winning the Olympics was a big it was a big moment. It was more re- I can say honestly, it was more relief than anything else. I hate to say that, but it was it was a relief. But the but in the moment of it, it was super exciting. You know, like, again, as the race was unfolding, I wasn't thinking about the pressure there. You're just like, so, you know, and again, I'm a rowing dork, right? So I'm into rowing. So you're so into the race and the excitement of it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, look, as Tim said, you know, we have a job to do and we have a big responsibility and, um, but yeah, there, there's, there's been, I don't know, uh, like each Olympic had, each Olympics had their own little moments and they were all special in their own way. And, you know, being able to, I think one of the most exciting things for me was, is being able to see all these great marquee athletes like an Usain Bolt. Or I remember just hanging out with Carl Lewis in 1984, just oh, hanging wow. out with Carl. And, and then Carl Lewis came and spoke to our crew. He just was hanging out downtown in Athens. He ran into one of the rowers. And then he came up to watch the race, and right before these guys were going to shove in Athens, he shows up. Yeah, just he goes, and he says, I'll never forget what he said. He goes, damn, you guys are athletes. Uh, And and I said, I said, no, Carl, you're an athlete. (laughs) That's why these guys are rowing, right? But but again, just special moments like that, people that you would never had the opportunity to see or meet, and you see them up close, and it's pretty cool. If you were to give advice to all of the coaches just starting out now, what's the one thing you would want to make sure that they that they knew? 
And it can be technical, it can be spiritual, it can be whatever you want. It's two words, baby steps, baby steps, two words. And again, I, because you see so often now, you know, and again, we were talking about it last night. Every Sunday night, Tim and Skip come over for dinner and we basically talk rowing with Kay and, you know, and we have a good time. And we're talking about how a lot of these high school coaches now, like these kids, they're novice rowers. They've never rowed and they come in and they have them doing, you know, four by 20 minutes. And, and you're just like, well, this kid doesn't, you know, it's just. I know because they got the East German training program or the right. or the, the British, you know, training diary or something like that. And and it's just like, look, you have to be able to walk before you can run. And it's just baby steps. You know, enjoy it, have fun with yep. it, learn the basic fundamentals, you know, and just rowing one oh one. Um and I, I again I always say and every time I coach I say I always say that baby steps. That's pretty great. Thank you. All right, Tim, what's your one piece of advice for all of these coaches? No pressure or anything. There's, always a, there's no shortage of advice. And, uh, you know, the internet these days is, is full of it. Uh, but in the, in the real world, you know, you have a moment there to capture people's attention in that first 30 seconds that you have the group in front of you. So you have to practice having a presence. Uh, you have to realize that you're the you're the main act, you're the deal. You know, you have to organize these kids, you have to be solving problems on the run. You have to be organized. That way, a little bit of variety in the program. As Mike said, like doing endurance pieces in 20 minutes without some shifts and some variety in numbers, you have to teach the kids starts. You can do starts on the fly, which Mike does a lot of. You know, you can rate 12 and 14, which people don't do enough of. You know, when you say, what's the main problem? Well, kids rush. Well, of course they're going to rush. So you have to develop strategies. So you've got to plan your session. You know, does anyone have a lesson plan for, for the practice? Of course not. I'm in Australia. We're, we're, most of the coaches in Australia are all school coaches. But, but they don't have a lesson plan. It's just better than stacking shelves at Costco as a job. So, you know, they go in there. It's more supervision. Mm. But if you're a proper coach and you like it, um, and you improve your ability to communicate and be a bit more animated, be a bit more organised and have a bit of a plan. I mean, you can vary stroke rate, you can vary pressure, you can vary distance. Uh, you've got drills there and, and you've got to encompass all of this. And you can teach them mid-race rate, you can finish with starts, you can rate 50, you can rate low. So you, you've got a lot of variety when you sit down and, and plan it and you should do little pieces of each it's not about the program. It's about teaching these kids and throwing in race work and starts and finishes and overrating and lots of other things. And, and you'll spend a lot of your time in fours and sixes and you've got, you know, you've got to practice doing that well. So I think managing the group, being organized, plan your practice. You guys are good at this. So my last question is really easy. It's what is your go-to meal as soon as you get off the water? You can say when you were rowing, full time, because this is more sort of relevant when you're, you know, it's, it's harder to justify the enormous plate of pancakes when you've been in the coaching launch for a few hours. I, I still would support you if that's your answer, but what's your go-to, you're getting off the water, what's your go-to meal? So when I was rowing, I can tell you that, you know, so I'm from Philly and you can imagine it's hot and humid there. And, and we have these things in, in Philadelphia, they have this thing called water ice, right? But it's, it's, they got their own, it's like an Italian thing. And, and there's all these places in Philly that have these water ice stands. And you, I would just go right to the water ice stand. Didn't matter if it was after morning practice, like water ice and a soft pretzel. That was yeah, And you can dip it. Like you get the water ice first because oh. you're. Ew, wait, Mike, I was with you until you dipped the pretzel in the watery ice. Water ice, yeah. <laughs> Tim, do you want to talk about Mike's eating habits? There's not, there's not a lot to say. Only that it's not that good. I am better. He is a good influence on me. He does make sure, like he does. Here, Mike. Here's a piece. Here's a banana. He like he's. He's shaking his head, Mike. Yeah, he's good. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm difficult. You know, I'm, I'm again, I'm 65. I'm setting up my ways. So Tim, is he difficult to feed? He doesn't eat a lot. He eats more of a night time, the wrong time of the day. But nonetheless, I, I won't be too critical there. <laughs> Um, I think when I was an athlete, that, and that's quite a while ago now, they just didn't eat that. There were no muesli bars and snacks and gels and goos. And, I mean, you weren't even encouraged to drink. We didn't never took a drink bottle out. 
Never took water out. <laughs> you didn't drink water in the boat? No, never. We talked, when I played football in high school, you weren't allowed to drink water. <laughs> And at halftime of every practice, they'd bring out a bucket of ice, and each guy was allowed to have one ice cube. That's fact. Now, we'd be arrested for that today, but that's the way it worked. I mean, Tim will tell you, right? We, you weren't allowed to have water. I think, well, they thought it, it weighed you down. That was a whole different, I mean. I'm, so you didn't have water bottles in the boat back when you guys were competing? I mean, and, and the, you know, when I was on the team in the 90s, but when I was on the team in the 70s, no. No. Yeah, I don't think we drank water growing up as kids. I don't remember drinking anything. All right, so Tim, what's your go-to meal? After practice, there was no food as such, and I had I had an hour's drive back home. Sometimes the coach would take you over to the pub for a beer, um, and that was good. So you know, because you, <laughs> you, you or you'd sleep at the boathouse. Yeah. You'd sleep at the boathouse, train in the morning, then drive down to work, work a full day, drive back up. You know, buy half a chook at the local, buy half a chicken at the local shop cook some vegetables on the stove. So it was a bit leaner. People were pretty lean. I mean, there's some big people row today. Uh, as a coach, it doesn't really matter. You've got to try and keep it as healthy as you can. You know. Do you talk to the guys about what they eat after practice or you just look the other way and they go and eat? The guys are pretty good. You know, they've got supplements. They bring food with them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty they're good. good. They're pretty yeah. solid. I think that, like, I don't really get involved in that, but they, they you know, look, they have all the information and they, I don't want to sort of, tell them what they should eat or not eat like they, but they're all pretty good. You see that they all have their, again, their bars and their mm -hmm. drinks and their, you know, yeah. yeah. And I they're, think they're living pretty good. together, you know, because the guys live in houses and I think they, you know, they've become better at cooking. I, I noticed a difference even from last year, the year before, now, the guys are getting better at that. So that grows on, they've got to be a little more organized. They take turns of cooking. It's like a little competition almost. So, oh. You know, I think they, they're getting an understanding of that without being too uh, crazy uh, on, on the diet. And, uh, you know, Liz Fusco is a nutritionist. She, she yes. gives the guys tips. And I know at the world, you know, I've seen a lot of nutritionists over the years. But, uh, you know, she's a worker. She prepares food and snacks and bars and drinks. Um, probably that encourages people to eat too much. But, you know, she is very practical. Rather than just dishing out the theories... She actually makes the stuff, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah, I think that's great too. Well, thank you both so much, Mike, Tim. This has been a lot of fun talking with you both. And um, really, you know, we'll all be cheering for you in Tokyo from a distance, um, from six feet away or, or more. Um, but thank you for, for joining us on The Swing of Things. Thank you. And that's all for this episode of The Swing of Things. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from some of our national team coaches. In our next episode, we hear from their athletes as they take the final steps towards Tokyo. If you enjoyed the episode, please like, share, and follow from wherever you get your podcasts. It will help others to find us. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch at the swing of things at usrowing